In this unit, we're going to continue our discussion of the molecular orbital theory of diatomic molecules, but we're going to broaden things out to what are called heteronuclear diatomics, which are molecules containing two atoms still, but two different atoms, meaning the molecular orbitals are going to start being asymmetric. They'll be larger on one atom or the other, and we'll talk about the principles and concepts underlying that skew in this video. We'll also look at the magnetic consequences of molecular orbital theory of the diatomics, learning how unpaired electrons affect the magnetic properties of these molecules. We'll also revisit bond order and touch again on how we can infer bond order from molecular orbital diagrams. So let's get into it. We're familiar from earlier discussions with this idea that in a homonuclear diatomic molecule, the two atoms are identical. And so the atomic orbitals involved in creating or building the molecular orbitals are identical. And because the molecule is symmetric as a whole, all the molecular orbitals are also symmetric. And so we get orbitals that look symmetric in an A2 or AA molecule like this. We also see very large energetic splitting between the bonding and antibonding orbitals. So here in this hypothetical example, for instance, we're seeing a large energy gap between the atomic orbitals of the individual A atoms and the sigma bonding and sigma star antibonding. And the same argument applies for pi type orbitals, um, molecular orbitals. In a heteronuclear diatomic molecule, the situation is different since in a molecule A, B, where A and B are not the same atom, A and B will differ in electronegativity, they'll differ in effective nuclear charge felt by the valence electrons, and so their orbital energies will differ. In this hypothetical example, B is more electronegative than A, and so it has lower energy atomic orbitals. And what we see in the case of a heteronuclear diatomic is kind of an uneven and generally smaller splitting of the molecular orbital energies. The gap, for example, between the AB sigma bonding uh, energy and the B atomic orbital energy is smaller here than it is in the A2 homonuclear case above. And something similar goes on for the antibonding orbital. This gap between the A atomic orbital energy and the antibonding molecular orbital energy is smaller in the heteronuclear case. The general idea here is that when the orbital energies, the atomic orbital energies, are more different, the splitting will be smaller. And at some point, we reach such a large energy gap that there's essentially negligible overlap between the two orbitals when the energy gap is large enough. And this is worth keeping in mind because it can keep our lives simple, that orbitals, atomic orbitals that are very far apart in energy generally don't overlap to a meaningful degree. Now, we also have the question with the heteronuclear diatomics of what do the orbitals look like? What do the molecular orbitals look like? We should generally expect them to be skewed, right, based on ideas about electron density and bond polarity that we're already familiar with. If B is more electronegative than A, then the electrons in the AB bond are spending most of their time on B. This seems to suggest, for example, that the filled molecular orbitals in the AB molecule should have larger lobes on B than on A, and we'll see that this comes out of the general principle actually right now. So the general principle underlying what molecular orbitals look like in a heteronuclear diatomic is the following. We have this splitting of the atomic orbitals to create the molecular orbital energies, right? And this means that each molecular orbital will be closer in energy to one or the other of the atomic orbitals that make it up. For example, the AB sigma bonding orbital is closer in energy to the B atomic orbital than it is to the A atomic orbital. And the closer energy atomic orbital is the one that primarily dictates the shape and is the greater contributor to the molecular orbital. The closer energy atomic orbital contributes more to the molecular orbital shape than the one, the, the atomic orbital that is, is not as close in energy. So for example, in this hypothetical AB molecule, if we looked at the bonding molecular orbital, well, that bonding molecular orbital is closer in energy to the B atomic orbital. So we would say that the AB sigma bonding orbital is B-like. It's a B-like molecular orbital. And if you were to look at the shape, you would see a larger lobe on 
the B atom than on A, something like this. Constructive overlap, so the shading is the same, but there's a much larger lobe on B than on A, and these electrons occupying this orbital spend most of their time on the more electronegative B, which is kind of exactly what we would expect, right? The antibonding orbital has the opposite situation. This antibonding orbital is closer in energy to the A atomic orbital, and so we would say that this orbital is A-like. It's got a larger lobe on A than on B. It's got a node between the nuclei, that's how we know it's antibonding, but this empty, unfilled antibonding orbital is skewed toward the less electronegative A atom. These are the general principles of homonuclear diatomic molecular orbitals, but they can also be generalized to orbitals associated with a bond between two atoms, even in a bigger molecule, where it's really these effects on the molecular orbitals that give rise to things like bond polarity and the skew of the electron density in a bond as a result of differences in electronegativity. Let's take a look now at two examples of molecular orbitals of heteronuclear diatomic molecules. On the left here we have NO. And the NO molecule is kind of interesting in that it has an odd number of electrons. But the first thing I would point out before we get into the orbital shapes is that the labels and types and numbers of orbitals are exactly the same as in the homonuclear case. We have a sigma 2s and a sigma star 2s, sigma 2p and a pi 2p. Notice sp mixing is a non-issue. This is generally true, but can get complicated for heteronuclear diatomics. And then we have the pi star orbitals and the sigma star orbital should be a star there. That's a little typo for NO. So the types and numbers of molecular orbitals are the same. It's the shapes, really, that are different. The molecular orbital shapes are skewed toward the more electronegative atom when we're talking about the lower energy orbitals and the less electronegative atom as those molecular orbitals go up in energy. So for example, in the sigma 2s and sigma star 2s combinations, we have a sigma 2s orbital that's skewed toward the more electronegative oxygen atom. Notice oxygen's atomic orbitals are here on the right, and so the 2s orbital at oxygen is closer in energy to the sigma 2s than nitrogen's 2s orbital is, so it makes sense that this lobe is larger. And then for the sigma star combination, well, we have the opposite situation, of course, right? With node between the nuclei and a larger lobe on nitrogen, the less electronegative nitrogen, higher energy 2s orbital is closer in energy to the sigma star orbital. And so this shape is consistent with the general principle. And in fact, the same ideas would apply, and this is a nice exercise to try on your own. What do you think the sigma 2p orbital would look like in this case? How would you depict the skew? Which side is going to be larger? Which lobe will be larger? The one contributed, or the ones, I should say, contributed by nitrogen, or the ones contributed by oxygen? Now, on the right-hand side, we have hydrogen and fluorine, hydrogen fluoride, or, or HF. And hydrogen produces some interesting wrinkles because it's not a second row element. Its valence atomic orbital is the only atomic orbital that's occupied in hydrogen, which is the 1s orbital. And the 1s orbital is spherical, and so it's got different symmetry from the 2p orbitals on fluorine. And, and this makes the molecular orbital diagram look very different, and very different from any MO diagram we've seen so far, and this is worth pointing out. So to begin to explore HF, let's just start with a very simple depiction of the HF molecule. Let's define the z-axis as the axis between the two nuclei, so that x and y are perpendicular to this internuclear axis. These are the molecular orbitals that we observe. And actually, if you focus your attention here outside of the blue highlighting, things look pretty normal initially, right? We have a constructive combination of the 1s orbital on hydrogen and the 2p orbital on fluorine. That's a bonding orbital, sigma bonding orbital. And we have a sigma antibonding orbital up here that is a destructive or subtractive combination of the 1s and 2p orbitals on hydrogen and fluorine, respectively. One thing that I'll point out that's kind of interesting is if you look at the atomic orbital energies, something very strange may jump out at you. The n equals 2 shell of fluorine is lower in energy than the n equals 1 shell of hydrogen. This is because of the massive electronegativity and the high effective nuclear charge of fluorine relative to hydrogen. 
all of the fluorine atomic orbitals are pulled so far down in energy that the n equals 2 shell of fluorine is on par with the n equals 1 shell of hydrogen. And the n equals 1 shell in fluorine is like way, way below the screen, right? It's so far down in energy, you can't even see the 1s orbital of fluorine on this diagram. All right. This leaves the orbitals that are highlighted in blue. What's going on with these? Well, they're labeled on the slide as non-bonding orbitals. What exactly does that mean? Well, one thing we can notice here, based on the fact that the energies of the orbitals don't change and they're labeled exactly the same as the atomic orbitals, is these molecular orbitals, quote unquote, are identical to the atomic 2s, 2px, and 2py orbitals of fluorine. So these orbitals highlighted in blue are sort of acting like the lone pairs on the fluorine atom that we would expect in the Lewis structure for HF. They're not engaged in bonding. They are pretty much unperturbed or unchanged atomic orbitals. The question we have now, though, really is, where do these come from, and why do they appear in the HF molecule where we don't see any non-bonding orbitals in a diagram like NO and in most of the other heteronuclear diatomic diagrams we'll look at? To begin to answer this question, let's start with our general molecular orbital diagram for HF and remind ourselves a little bit about what's going on here. So we have the hydrogen orbitals, atomic orbitals on the left, and the fluorine atomic orbitals on the right. Fluorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, so the 2p orbitals of fluorine are similar in energy to the 1s orbital of hydrogen, and the 2s orbital of fluorine is actually much, much lower in energy than the 1s orbital of hydrogen. This helps us explain where this non-bonding orbital comes from because, of course, we can absolutely envision or entertain the idea of a 2s plus 1s combination of hydrogen and fluorine to generate like a sigma 1s plus 2s bonding orbital, right, that's going to be lower in energy than the fluorine's 2s orbital. The problem with this is these orbitals are so far separated in energy that they essentially don't interact. Going back to this general principle that the farther apart in energy atomic orbitals are, the weaker their interaction. And so the orbital, the molecular orbital that appears here is essentially an undisturbed, unperturbed 2s orbital as a result of this extremely weak interaction between the fluorine 2s and hydrogen 1s orbitals. These 2p orbitals are a bit more of an interesting situation. And at fluorine, as for all the second row elements, we've got three different p orbitals along the x, y, and z directions. And let's again think of the z axis as the axis parallel to the bond, the internuclear axis, essentially. All right. Well, the 2pz orbital is pointed directly at the hydrogen atom. And so we can create a pretty standard looking sigma bonding orbital through constructive overlap of the hydrogen 1s and the fluorine 2pz orbital like this. This looks like sigma bonding orbitals that we've seen previously in, you know, for example, homonuclear diatomic molecules. But it's, a, it's an sp combination, which makes it a little bit unique, but nonetheless pretty standard looking sigma orbital. What if we tried to do a similar kind of overlap with the perpendicular PY or PZ orbitals? Well, in this case, the resulting molecular orbital would look something like this. And the issue with this, and the reason it doesn't give rise to a new molecular orbital, for example, like a pi-type molecular orbital, is that the 1s orbital actually doesn't have pi-type symmetry. It's got sigma-type symmetry. and it has constructive overlap with one lobe of this atomic orbital on fluorine, but destructive overlap with the other lobe. And so there's no net overlap here. The, the resulting orbital overlap, the resulting combination, is neither bonding nor anti-bonding, right? And so there's, it's, it's actually non-bonding, right? There is no net stabilization or destabilization, no energetic you know, splitting or anything along those lines as a result of this overlap, which is half constructive and half destructive, essentially. And in that situation, then, the 2PY orbital essentially does not interact with the hydrogen 1S orbital. And what ends up happening is all of the hydrogen 1S orbital goes into forming this sigma bonding orbital. Um, well, I should say half goes into this and half goes into the antibonding combination.
right? This type of overlap is not observed in the molecular orbital diagram. And the situation is similar and exactly analogous for the 2p x orbital, which would be along the x-axis, kind of perpendicular to your screen is how you might think about this. And so these orbitals being unable as a result of their different symmetry to overlap with the hydrogen 1s just get plopped into the middle of the diagram as non-bonding orbitals localized on fluorine. And you might imagine, and if you do, you would be correct, that regardless of the other atom here, so for something like HO, HF, HBr, HCl, the situation is going to be the same. Uh, and we're going to have two non-bonding 2p orbitals on that heavier atom as a result of the spherical symmetry of the hydrogen 1s orbital. This is a general principle, general idea that we see for HX molecular orbital diagrams.